give you greetings, warm, warm welcome for being here under these very special circumstances. I'm uh, speaking from the um, from one of the buildings, one of the facilities of the University of Siena, where the law department, amongst others, is located. Uh, and it's a, um, somehow uh, of, of, of great importance for us to be able to uh, at least have a few of us uh, speaking uh, from here. Facility is still uh, not accessible to students for regular uh, teaching and exam uh, activity, but the library is accessible uh, and the building is accessible for um, the, the teaching staff and research staff. And um, this project has been uh, uh, going on since 2018. It's a two year Jean Monnet uh, EU funded uh, project. Um, we approached the end. This is, the, as you know, the final conference. And uh, uh, what we uh, celebrate through our encounter today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow is, in fact, uh, a bit of a journey together. Uh, when uh, we uh, had the idea for the application, the security was, of course, the main concern, the key, the key word. Uh, the uh, colleagues, uh, from the University of Siena, who had this idea. Um, Professor Santoro is here with us, Riccardo Pavoni, Alessandro Ramieri, and others are with me today. Uh, wanted to uh, take this uh, keyword and this concept of security as, at the same time, the focus of a concern for investigation and communication the two axes of uh, the Jamone action, and at the same time as a sort of federative uh, theme. We still very often too fragmented in our research and even in our education, including in law schools. Our desire was to uh, look at security as it should be for the sake of citizens, for the sake of people, looking at security as an issue, and therefore uh, try to be competent, of course, try to mobilize the backgrounds of competence, but at the same time uh, to challenge ourselves in terms of bridging uh, different disciplinary backgrounds. That's why we uh, divided the theme we actually articulated the theme, we broke it down to circulation of uh, data, circulation of capital, circulation of people and migrants. The uh, Jean Monnet has been carried through uh, several activities and several meetings. They are somehow reflected uh, in this uh, final conference. They are uh, represented by many people who are in the attendance today. And I really wish uh, to give a big, big thanks uh, after having expressed my gratitude to the colleagues uh, from University of Siena, to all those who partnered with us uh, from other institutions uh, since, of course, this is uh, our initiative from Siena, but this is also very much a collaborative effort. We are very grateful to the Slovak, to the Slovak partners. We are very uh, grateful to the, the Flensburg team. We are very uh, grateful to uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler, uh, which is, by the way, uh, also helping us with uh, uh, logistics. Uh, today, uh, as far as the um, uh, 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 broadcasting is concerned. Now, um, 
let me let me uh, also uh, express uh, my gratitude to uh, all those in the attendance who were previously involved in uh, our events for this project. Um, I, I, I will not go through the different names, but it's 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 really good to see people who were involved in previous workshops or seminars or conferences to be here with us today uh, because of our focus which, which which was which is very broad we were able to uh, meet in uh, very dif different contexts including uh, the um, uh, tumors uh, 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 the oncological center in Milan or the Bank of Italy uh, I see uh, here just mentioning you Walter uh, uh, Walter Negrini, who was in the attendance and who, who was uh, 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 very uh, well, who was actually seminal in our um, workshop at uh, Bank of Italy on security and uh, circulation of capitals. Um, I wish to thank uh, uh, the uh, PhD students who are here with us. Uh, many thanks to, again, Vittorio Santoro and Alessandro Palmieri, who run uh, our um, PhD program. We're very, very happy to have um, PhD students uh, uh, with us today. And uh, many thanks to all of you. Uh, I, I will not be able to include all the <laughs> categories of people uh, who are with us today. Now, um, uh, this event is made possible in the first place by our speakers. So I will now move into uh, welcoming you all and, and giving my, my, my warmest thanks for having accepted to prepare your papers. Thank you so much for uh, your dedication and uh, your, your presence uh, with us today. Um, the uh, director of the law school uh, um, was not able to come due to a last minute uh, obligation. Uh, he asked uh, me and the colleagues and Alessandro to uh, give uh, everybody uh, his warm uh, welcome as well. As far as the organization of this uh, uh, conference online is concerned, I would uh, I have to give uh, uh, my biggest thanks to Isabella Mazet. She's uh, she's been uh, a pillar of this event, and she will now uh, share with us uh, a. Um, uh, slide uh, with some uh, uh, details about the recording. Uh, we uh, will be recording this event for the sake of accountability vis-a-vis -vis the EU Commission. Uh, and uh, as we uh, especially know because of our interest in circulation of data, so we are supposed we are supposed to run a, a research project which is very much depending on the GDPR, so we are also supposed to be the first uh, not, uh, well, in, in full compliance with the GDPR. So as you can read now, I am in accordance with the GDPR, by participating in the event, you consent to the processing and use of pictures taken uh, during the event, as well as to the use of streaming services and presentations and declare that the foundation, Fondazione Bruno Kleisler, who's running the event online, will not be charged for any of them. Uh, for you not to be filmed or recorded, you should disable your welcome and microphone, which uh, in, in any case, we ask you to do for the sake of uh, um, avoiding uh, noise in the background and for the sake of uh, uh, keeping the connection as light as possible. Um, uh, uh, before giving the floor uh, to uh, Riccardo um, Pavoni, who will be the, uh, our first chair, and then to Professor Valtes, who is uh, uh, our first uh, uh, keynote speaker, together with uh, Professor Sturma, 
I would just like to say on my side, from my side as a, an expert on law and religion, how important he, uh, 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 our effort is in terms of uh, uh, preparing, nourishing a comprehensive uh, notion of security. Um, we've been experiencing uh, with our uh, with our project uh, the role of the European Union, European countries at large, as a unique experiment uh, of an alternative approach to security. This is a project, this is a desire, this comes with, of course, tensions and conflicts, but as uh, witnessed by the GDPR itself, we, uh, 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 we cherish our European sense of being committed to security in uh, a comprehensive way. Uh, I'm influenced here by my experience uh, now, it's been now some years with the OSC and the panel of experts on freedom of religion or belief. We just issued the first ever international documents recommending uh, 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 reconciling of freedom of religion or belief and security. You're probably aware that the OSC, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is based on what we call a comprehensive understanding of security. Well, if the OSC has a special mandate and tradition for that, for sure the EU uh, has a, 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 a strong uh, uh, word to say and a strong example to give. We started our project with the GDPR. We ending this project with the end of the public consultation meeting launched by the EU Commission on the artificial intelligence of the future for the EU. And uh, from my side, all I would like to say is that this is really the best example of what Europe and the European Union can achieve in terms of an alternative, comprehensive, human-centered and citizen-centered understanding of security, which has been the motivation central to our endeavor. Thank you so much again, uh, and uh, the word to is now the floor. Uh, uh, now goes to Riccardo Pavoni for um, the first session of our meeting. So thank you very much, Marco, for your introduction. Um, I, I will not repeat what you have already said about by way of general presentation of our research project. I would just say a couple of words about this uh, forthcoming session. Uh, first of all, I would like to disclose that I should share uh, the chair of this session with uh, my colleague Alessandro Palmieri, who has actually uh, done, uh, uh, shared a lot of work with me in the organ scientific organization of this project. Uh, I would also would like to thank very much Gian Maria Milani, who is with us today and has done uh, a lot of work uh, both on the scientific and organizational side. So it's just by chance that I'm here, but uh, those two colleagues uh, should also be here with me. Uh, but we cannot have a triple chair, so I will take the chair of this first session. And uh, uh, this, our idea was to devote some introductory uh, presentations uh, by some, uh, uh, say, well-known scholars with a deep expertise in certain areas of European law and policy, which are very much relating to the, to the specific issues that, that we will analyze in the following sessions. Uh, so uh, we thought that we should, uh, let's say, uh, uh, organize some kind of uh, uh, the general presentations covering some cross-cutting issues which will be very helpful in uh, in the in uh, in the forthcoming in the following uh, sessions so we organized this first session as a, um, as a, as as a session devoted to some keynote speeches we have here with us today uh, professor jan wouters uh, 
who will be the first speaker. His presentation will be followed by Professor Pavel Sturma. And then we are supposed to have a, a short break. Then the organizers will tell me how long we should have uh, that break. And following the break, we will have two more scholars. Uh, that is uh, Professor Roberto Pardolesi and Professor Federico Lenzerini. Um, my only recommendation is that you please uh, uh, limit your own presentation to maximum 30 minutes and uh, because we would also uh, love very much to have uh, a discussion session at the end of your presentations. So the, the first speaker today uh, is uh, Professor Jan Wouters, who is a full professor of international law and international organization at, at the Catholic University of Leuven. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University in the USA. And I would love especially to mention that Professor Wouters uh, holds a Jean Monnet Ad Personam Chair in EU and Global Governance. Uh, we must mention Jean Monnet actions in this context. So I think that it's, uh, this collaboration with Professor Wouters is very much welcome in our context because of the networking effect it has on uh, the Jean Monnet actions at large. Professor Wouters is also the director of the Leuven Center for Global, Global Governance Studies, uh, which is itself a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. So uh, the topic of Professor Wouters' speech uh, will be the European Common Foreign and Security Policy. We, we gave uh, Professor Wouters a very broad title, uh, the Common Foreign and Security Policy of the EU past, present, and future, so that we will be able to analyze uh, this theme uh, as he prefers. So, Professor Wouters, the floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you for uh, inviting me to, to, to talk, and even to talk as the first uh, keynote speaker at this uh, wonderful conference. I, uh, I'm a great fan of the University of Siena, and I really wish I could have been there because it's such an incredibly beautiful and uh, powerful um, um, university and, and city. So, but we'll do our best to, to engage with you with regard to a number of issues that touch upon the CFSP. And as you rightly said, it's a very broad topic because you asked me to talk about the past, the present and the future. And as uh, you know from the quote of Winston Churchill, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. So it's a little bit hard to talk about the future. And most of my talk, I guess, will try to see where we are coming from. Because indeed, it is a remarkable history, CFSP. And um, it is, I think, a, a history that shows that there is actually a lot of continuity in the topics and the issues and the challenges that remain with us until today. But I think it is, it is useful to look back at what has happened with regard to uh, CFSP. Because as you may know, we are now, um, well, not yet 30 years, but at least we are 28 years after the Maastricht Treaty was signed in February 1992. And as we all know, it was the Maastricht Treaty, which uh, not just introduced the European Union, but also the system of three pillars of which the uh, common foreign and security policy, the CFSP, La PESC, um, was and actually still is the second uh, pillar. And it's interesting to note that basically every single important treaty change that we have witnessed ever since, from Maastricht to Amsterdam, to Nice, to the European Constitutional Treaty, to the Lisbon Treaty, CFSP has always been amended. So it is clearly a kind of constant experimentation uh, process and an exercise in refining um, the mechanisms and instruments at the disposal of the uh, European Union. But still, in spite of all these changes, uh, I cannot hide the, say, um, my position that I see it a little bit as a movie in slow motion. 
Um, I once wrote a piece in which I basically refer to the beautiful Latin expression festina lente. CRSP from Maastricht to Lisbon and beyond has been in a certain way the European Union moving and always adjusting, but to be honest, in a rather slow uh, manner with a lot of continuity. And in a certain way, it's refreshing to see how topical the issues are still today that were already on the agenda. Uh, uh, when, for instance, the Intergovernmental Conference on Political Union was held to prepare the Maastricht uh, Treaty. I should, of course, when I talk about the past, also talk about the past pre-Maastricht, and notably about the forerunner of the CFSP, which is European Political Cooperation, EPC. And as you know, um, EPC was launched basically 50 years ago, in 1970, and was a very interesting uh, kind of area of policy making because it was totally outside of the institutional framework of the communities and of the institutions of the communities. And so interestingly, throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, there was still this very clear distinction between on the one hand, um, the external relations of the European communities, uh, which included of course, the very important common commercial policy and a, a number of additional um, emerging uh, external relations areas, such as development cooperation. But then there was on the other side, the uh, EPC, the harder foreign policy, which was completely outside of the mandate and the competences of the European uh, communities. And of course, uh, we cannot go too far back, uh, way back in time, but it's important to remind ourselves that, especially when it is about security and defense, we had some, let's say, uh, less fortunate uh, experiences in the 1950s already, when you had the aborted effort to establish a European defense community. And basically, uh, when you go back and see uh, to the so-called Fouché plans of uh, France and General uh, de Gaulle in 1960, 1961, which already back then aimed to complement the existing uh, communities with a, a foreign policy and political uh, dimension. Those plans also failed, but I have to be honest, I recently revisited the Fouché plans, and with hindsight, it's really remarkable to see how much in a certain way later on, uh, parts of those Fouché plans have actually uh, been realized. So it's, it's quite remarkable, the European Union it always looks like something new is happening, but for certain things, you really can go uh, way, uh, way back in time. And apparently, you just need the right momentum for certain ideas to be acceptable, salon fähig, and to be uh, accepted by uh, the member states and put into uh, the treaties. Maybe uh, just a few more words on the EPC, the predecessor of the CFSP because there too you saw a gradual evolution in the 70s and the 80s. I think that um, some institutionalization was already happening with the establishment of the political uh, committee, which really did a lot of consultation, coordination and cooperation. We absolutely did not talk about a transfer of competences to a European level, but we saw also a form of, let's say, accommodation by the member states. So gradually, EPC expanded to an ever larger set of foreign policy issues. And actually, um, member states really started to take it into account, to really start behaving in function of, say, uh, common uh, positions made under the EPC. Interestingly, but that's for, let's say, the more senior colleagues uh, um, that we are uh, discussing with today. Um, before the Maastricht Treaty, you will recall that you had in 1986, the single European Act. Uh, Jan, Jan your, your microphone is not working. I was jumping with my hands, gesticulating too much al Italien, I'm afraid. So I, I switched on my microphone again. I think you lost me when I was talking uh, about the single European Act. And uh, what I just wanted to say is it's, it's largely been forgotten uh, by most scholars nowadays. 
but I continue to see it as a very important interim uh, treaty that really for the first time brought EPC in the treaty uh, construction. Of course, not an integrated manner like uh, the, U the Union uh, of the Maastricht Treaty, but EPC uh, was in a certain way brought closer to uh, the communities. And um, so what we also saw by the end of the 1980s, early 1990s, that was that this separation of the EPC on the one hand and the community on the other, on the other hand was really not uh, sustainable. I mean, there was increasingly the awareness that you don't have strict boundaries between on the one hand external economic affairs and uh, political uh, matters on, on the other hand. And there were already then a number of testing uh, crises. You may recall uh, the Gulf crisis in the 1980s. Uh, there was, of course, also the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein in 1990. Um, there was the, well, the dissolution, the disintegration of the former Yugoslavia and so on. So we really saw that the lack of um, a sufficiently coordinated uh, reactions of member states in their foreign policy was really hampering us. And it is interesting to revisit the European Council conclusions of Rome, eh? noblesse oblige, it was in Rome, that in December 1990, uh, you had the twin mandate for the two intergovernmental conferences that would result in the Maastricht Treaty. The one was on political union, the other on EMU, as you may recall, but the uh, mandate of the European Council on political union already made very, very clear that they wanted to develop a CFSP and that one of the prime concerns was to uh, uh, enhance the capacity of the union to speak with one voice in the international scene and also to en in, uh, enhance the coherence and cohesion of EU external uh, relations. Okay. Now, let, let me quickly say a few things about the Maastricht Treaty, where we are now, uh, concluded uh, in, in 1992, entered into force 1st of November 1993. The Maastricht Treaty with its famous three pillar uh, structure, where you had the communities in pillar one, and notably CFSP in uh, pillar two. That was um, clearly the price we had to pay for bringing CFSP under the roof of the European Union because of because now we do we did have the so-called single uh, overarching uh, institutional framework of the European Union that also applied to CFSP but of course all of you who have ever read um, the Maastricht Treaty know that the decision making processes the role the respective role of the institutions under CFSP was very, very different from the community method, la méthode communautaire. I'm still regretting the fact that we have banned that terminology from the current treaties, but you see what I mean. The integrated way of policy making of the first pillar clearly did not apply and does not apply to the CFSP. I will come back to that uh, question now. What is interesting with Maastricht, because it was a very important step forward, was that the CFSP as a second pillar really described itself in a very bold manner. It really said that it covered all areas of foreign and security policy, including even all questions related to the security of the Union. And you may recall the difficult compromise formula because there is reference to the eventual framing of a common defense policy, which might in time lead to a common defense very hard fought compromise, I guess, a big breakthrough if you think back of the taboo and the, the, let's say the, the traumatism caused by the uh, failure of the European defense community in the 1950s. So it is interesting uh, still today to look back at the second pillar in the version of the Maastricht Treaty because the objectives of the foreign uh, policy were quite interesting. They were already referring to safeguarding the common values of the European Union, its independence of the Union, which is interesting because the Union was a new construct. You may recall that it did not even have legal personality under the Maastricht uh, arrangements. The reference to the United Nations Charter, to the principles of the Helsinki Final Act, remember, we were just after the end of the Cold War, uh, and then also the development and consolidation of democracy, the rule of law, 
and respect for uh, fundamental rights. So in, in a way, I mean, you can still recognize a great number of the CFSP principles in the version of Maastricht of nearly 30 years ago and in the version that we currently have uh, with regard uh, to the Lisbon uh, Treaty. The instruments of, um, say, CFSP, that's also an interesting story. Because there, if you go back to the very old Davignon report and so on uh, that were preceding the actual EPC, you already saw the, the, the elaboration of instruments such as the joint action, and the common position, and uh, l'action commune, and la position commune, and so on. And that has been codified in the Maastricht Treaty. Um, but, I mean, the Maastricht Treaty tried to do a couple of new things. Um, especially trying to also, uh, when the council would decide on a joint action, at the times of the Maastricht Treaty, that was still something for which you needed first a kind of political go-ahead, an invitation and guidelines from the European Council. So you, I mean, that's another constant thing in CFSP, the predominant role of the two intergovernmental institutions, the European Council, the Council of Ministers, which nowadays you see post-Lisbon, in the so-called Foreign Affairs Council. And it continues to be interesting to see how the treaty makers struggle to define the respective role of the European Council versus the Council. Officially, the European Council is meant to give political guidelines, as you know, and, and to, to steer the process for the important strategic directions, including for foreign policy. But we all know that then and even today, the European Council is not really doing that. It's not really although it's an institution now since Lisbon, it's not really, in my view, steering the course of EU foreign policy. It's not doing that enough for the simple reason that it only convenes, like, of course, at summits and doesn't uh, meet, um, let's say, uh, regularly or at least not, not continuously. And moreover, that the, the big political issues on the, and crisis on the agenda of the European Council make it more like a kind of crisis management committee than a real strategic policy um, uh, setter for European uh, foreign uh, policy. So that's something about uh, the Council and the European Council. What continues to puzzle me with regard to the Maastricht Treaty, when we compare it to today's uh, Lisbon Treaty, and some colleagues may have had similar uh, reflections, is the question of the role of the Commission. The Commission under the Maastricht Treaty was fully associated with CFSP. That was the terminology of the treaty. And the commission could indeed refer to the question, any, to the council, any question on CFSP, could even submit proposals and so on. Now, um, the role of the commission in a way even increased under the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997, because there, interestingly, the commission was even brought within the Troika structure. And so you could say that Amsterdam, in a certain way, was the zenith of the role of the Commission under uh, CFSP. Strangely enough, for me, still puzzling, is the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the the Lisbon Treaty has basically totally done away with the Commission in CFSP. The reference to full association has been removed from the treaties. The Commission can no longer submit its own proposals to the Council. At most, it can do this through the so-called high representative with the support of the Commission initiatives. And um, the Commission is not really anymore uh, into representation and, or implementation of, of the CFSP. So strangely enough, I'm afraid to say that the dualism between the pillars and the singularity of the CFSP today is maybe even stronger than it was initially under Maastricht and definitely under the uh, Amsterdam uh, Treaty. Maybe one last reflection on um, the, um, say, the role of the other institutions uh, in CFSP under the Maastricht arrangements. You know that the role of the European Parliament and of the Court of Justice has always been extremely limited, and that stays the case today, even though we have seen interesting recent case law of the European Court of Justice. But so the democratic scrutiny of CFSP activities, especially by the European Parliament, remains extremely, uh, uh, say, um, limited. I'm not going to go into the detail of the nuances of the treaty provisions, but the very fact is that it escapes largely 
the scrutiny of the European Parliament. And it is interesting to note that this is, is in a way, still the case today, with the difference that now, interestingly, we have a, a kind of inter-parliamentary conference on CFSP uh, matters and on CSDP matters, which brings in also delegations from national parliaments to have some kind of democratic um, dialogue with the policymakers. I would not call it a form of control or even scrutiny, but there is something more today than there used to be in the past. I make a footnote here because some colleagues may disagree with me and say, no, in the past, we had the WEU assembly in Paris, yeah, the Western European Union, and that parliamentary assembly also had at least some form of role. I found it a very interesting thing, and I, I'm always sad when uh, I read about the demise of the Western European Union and its uh, simple abolition back in 2011. But okay, Maastricht, we saw the big breakthrough, CFSP was created, there was a lot of codification of existing practice of the EPC, but there was also an interesting further uh, uh, evolution and refinement of, of decision-making and instruments. The same can be said about the uh, amendments of the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997. It's interesting to note that already the Amsterdam Treaty um, showed the awareness of the member states that they needed a permanent actor for CFSP. Under Maastricht, that was not the case. You had the rotating presidencies every six months. And you may recall that Amsterdam saw the very first introduction of a high representative, then called high representative for CFSP. You may recall that this was a kind of also multiple habit function in the sense that it was combined with the role of secretary general of the council. Uh, when Mr. Solana, Javier Solana was made uh, the first incumbent of that post. In fact, he also started to combine it with a third function, namely as Secretary General of the Western European Union. And again, I have a footnote here, but I don't have the answer to my footnote. That is, I've always wondered whether he had a double or a triple salary. I don't know. It would be uh, something interesting to ask him uh, now that he is retired. Okay, so you had um, the high representative and you saw also some refinement of the of the of the instruments namely the introduction of common strategies to be developed by the european council again the hope and expectation that from the top political level you would get guidance towards the council for the great common strategies it has not been a real success because to my knowledge the only common strategies adopted were on russia and on ukraine in 1999 and one on the mediterranean region in 2000 and the instrument was basically abolished with um, the Lisbon uh, Treaty. Procedurally, it was interesting to note that there was some very pragmatic progress with the Amsterdam Treaty because under, uh, um, under Maastricht, everything was basically unanimity with some very, very minor uh, exceptions. That was refined under Amsterdam because although unanimity remained the rule in the council, uh, new things were, um, um, say, um, invented, such as the possibility of abstentions and the so-called constructive abstentions. Time does not allow me to uh, really develop on the constructive abstention, which I found very interesting when it was uh, written into the treaty. But to be very honest, um, it has, to my knowledge, not really been a big success. It, I have only seen one application of the constructive abstention uh, in the past, and that was the joint action setting up ULEX uh, in Kosovo when, when Cyprus uh, abstained. I think still member states don't have a real appetite for the idea of constructive uh, abstentions, let alone for the idea of qualified majority voting, to which I will come uh, towards the end of my presentation. Mr. President, I also count on you for telling me that my time is limited and from time to time you do something like five or three or one minute or just stop. Um, it's just that I'm not watching my clock while I'm um, in, the, in the fire of my uh, presentation. I'm in the Amsterdam Treaty and the Amsterdam Treaty does also something quite interesting with regard to the uh, security and defense uh, policy. You see an integration of the so-called Petersburg tasks in uh, the treaty. Petersburg tasks refer back to a summit of the Western European Union of 1992, 
and included humanitarian and rescue tasks, peacekeeping tasks, combat forces in crisis management, including peacemaking. And here you see how the EU is gaining some autonomy because although still reference is being made to the Western European Union, which is called an integral part of uh, the uh, development of the Union, of the operational capability of the Union, we know that partially thanks to the Amsterdam Treaty arrangements, um, the let's say the European Council started to gradually integrate the tasks and also the instruments and even the institutions of the Western European Union into the European Union. Yeah? And uh, you may recall that indeed uh, there was then a, um, a further consolidation of that within this treaty where every reference to the Western European Union simply uh, disappeared. In other words, by that time, the European Union had absorbed, and if you wish, swallowed up or eaten up some of the main institutions of the Western European Union with regard to security and defense. Uh, I have a very good colleague and friend who uh, continues to, to consider that example of the EU swallowing up another European organization as the phenomenon of the black widow, the EU as a black widow, namely uh, it, it uh, comes close, it's, it incrementally increases its competences, and then at a certain moment, it eats you up. It has happened with the Western European Union. Uh, some of you who have followed other fields like space policy may ask yourself whether at some stage this may also happen with the European Space Agency in Paris. It's a very, very, um, say, a controversial issue, but it happens. The EU, as we know, has the tendency to spread its tentacles and to slowly but surely invade other policy fields, which until then were uh, the area of another uh, organization. I come to um, this millennium, the, the NIST Treaty. Um, the NIST Treaty, of course, has a little bit uh, ironically been presented as une salade niçoise, which for me at least, uh, uh, knowing a little bit of the Italian cuisine, uh, which is very copious, the salat niçoise is a little bit, let's say, meager. Eh? It's a little bit, it's, it's very healthy, but not what you call very substantial. And that was also the case of the Treaty of Nice, which was meant to prepare the EU for the upcoming enlargement, and which in a way failed to do that. That's why afterwards we had the whole Convention on the Future uh, of Europe. But you saw a small increase of qualified majority voting in Nice, namely the appointment process of the high representative would be done with qualified uh, majority. I have a little anecdote to explain why you suddenly had QMV for those top appointments, but uh, I will uh, only keep that for the Q&A if, if you want. The NIST Treaty also codified a couple of other um, new developments. And you know, by 2000, 2001, we had seen a major change of attitude on the United Kingdom side with the arriving in power of Tony Blair and New Labour. And already in 1998, you may recall that there had been the famous Saint-Malo declaration between France and the United Kingdom that agreed that the EU should have its own capacity for autonomous um, action. And that, of course, only got reinforced by the experiences with the Kosovo crisis. And you will recall that the European Council, in those European Council sessions, you really had important uh, CFSP and CSDP uh, decisions, the European Council of June 1999 in Cologne decided to establish the European security and defense policy. And also later on in December 1999, you had the Helsinki European Council that developed the military capabilities of the Union further with the so-called Helsinki headline uh, goals. So in other words, you saw under the, today, let's say, um, pressure of events such as the Kosovo crisis, you saw a fairly rapid set of developments by the end of the 1990s and uh, the beginning of this millennium, which in a certain way were continued in the beginning of our millennium with things such as the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the terrorist attacks in Madrid and in um, London in 2004 and 2005. The adoption also, thanks to uh, the brilliant diplomacy of uh, Javier Solana, of the European security strategy in 2003, a year which for the rest was uh, a so-called annus horribilis for um, multilateralism, both at the global and at the regional level. But we came out of that with this 
European security strategy, which for a long time continued to define CFSP, I would say basically until Federica Mogherini in 2016 uh, presented her uh, global strategy. Between uh, the NIST Treaty and today, sorry to interrupt you, would the five, ten minutes be enough for you? Definitely, definitely. And again, I mean, I will be very happy to uh, elaborate certain things in um, the uh, Q&A, in the interactive uh, session. In those five minutes, I can still talk a little bit about the more recent past or the present and maybe some speculative things about uh, the future. We come now to the time of, well, famous moments like the Laken uh, Declaration under the Belgian presidency in December 2001, the Convention on the Future of Europe elaborating its treaty establishing a constitution for Europe, which, although it was signed at a beautiful ceremony in Rome, um, was never uh, really entering into force because of negative referenda in the spring of 2005, notably in France and uh, the Netherlands. But we all know that uh, after a certain reflection period and under the German presidency of the spring of 2007, the first German presidency with Frau Merkel, we saw the big breakthrough because there was going to be not a constitutional treaty, but a reform treaty, which we later would call the Lisbon Treaty, and which we would put basically 95% of the substance of the constitutional treaty in um, uh, a new treaty that would, unlike uh, the um, um, constitution, not be full text, it will be amendments of the existing treaties. In other words, it will be totally illegible for citizens and even for uh, parliament members. And probably that was intentional, so because that method had worked before the referenda of the European constitution. So we have the Lisbon Treaty, um, entry into force 1st of December 2009, after uh, somewhat cumbersome ratification uh, process. Uh, I'm not going to go into the ratification process, the Irish referendum and other uh, hiccups, but as you can already gouge, it becomes ever more difficult to make treaty um, uh, amendments in the formal manner uh, for the enlarged European Union. And I think that in a certain way, after the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, most member states have taken the attitude from, let's not touch the treaties anymore. It's too delicate. And to be very honest, if you talk with diplomats today who are discussing the setting up of the so-called um, conference on the future of the European Union, um, they are extremely reluctant to do that, especially when the perspective is opened of new formal treaty amendments. So member states have learned that treaty amendments are a very tricky and dangerous kind of uh, thing. The Lisbon Treaty's um, changes uh, are known. It replaced and made succeed the European community by a European Union, which officially uh, received international legal personality, one union with a single institutional framework, um, and a, a union also where officially the pillars were abolished. The sad reality is, however, that the second pillar, namely CFSP, is alive and kicking. But we need to be aware of something very, very important and remarkable. All the other policy fields of the EU have been communitarized. So in a certain way, it's the final victory for la méthode communautaire, the, the Lisbon Treaty. All those integrated policy fields are in the TFEU. And yeah, on the insistence of our British friends, CFSP was put as the only policy field in the TEU. And you need to just read again Article 24, Paragraph 1 of the EU Treaty to see how strongly the specificity, the intergovernmental nature, and the, the different roles of the institutions is stressed for uh, the CFSP. So in a certain way, you could say that the Lisbon Treaty left most of the substantive rules and procedures of CFSP largely unchanged, which was, I think, a missed opportunity, but that was the realities with which we were faced. And already under the discussions of the Convention on the Future of Europe, it was clear that member states would never ever agree on a com communitarization of uh, CFSP. Unanimity remains the general rule with some exceptions for QMV, 
What is important is, of course, that the common security and defense policy, the CSDP, has become much more elaborated. There's a separate treaty section on it, even though it is specified that it is an integral part of CFSP. You see some very important innovations, including the introduction of the so-called mutual assistance and solidarity clauses, Article 42, Paragraph 7, when a member state is the victim of an armed aggression. We cannot comment that too deeply here, but I may point to the fact that quite interestingly and surprisingly, the French president, uh, François Hollande, invoked that clause uh, when uh, you had the terrorist attacks in Paris with the Bataclan in November 2015. He invoked that clause rather than invoking the so-called solidarity clause for terrorist attacks that is in Article 222 of the TFEU, a quite remarkable kind of thing. And then, of course, I should say that there was the framework created for permanent structured cooperation, uh, PESCO, which for a long time was a dormant beauty. And between 2009 and 2017, nothing really happened in that area. But then, uh, also thanks to Federica Mogherini, we saw indeed uh, in the autumn of um, 2017 the first operationalization and 25 of the 27 member states agreeing on a, a, a number of projects with regard to permanent uh, structured uh, cooperation. I come at the end of my story, uh, Mr. President, allow me just, if I may, um, a few considerations maybe also to feed our discussion, because I haven't spoken about the future. Um, and that's, of course, too bad. But part of the future is, of course, the present. And we know that we currently have a European Commission under uh, Ursula von der Leyen, which uh, sees itself as a geopolitical uh, commission. And where we also know that already in her famous assignment letters uh, to her various commissioners, including her vice president, who is also high representative for foreign affairs and security policy now, Josep Borrell, she asked him to seek, and I quote, seek to use the clauses in the treaties that allow certain decisions on the CFSP to be adopted by qualified majority voting. So that's literally uh, a mission uh, that, that uh, von der Leyen has attributed to Mr. Borrell, who apparently seemed to like the idea. And to be honest, it's not entirely new. Uh, this issue has popped up at, at many intergovernmental conferences before. But also the Juncker Commission uh, in 2017 in the State of the Union, Juncker had referred to the need for more qualified majority decision making in CFSP. And the Commission under Juncker had even made a remarkable communication with some proposals in that respect. Remarkable, why? Because as I told you, under the Lisbon Treaty, the Commission has totally faded away under the CFSP pillar. And to be honest, that communication of the Juncker Commission did not have much uh, impact. The big question for the future is indeed, will the current exercise of enlarging cases of qualified majority voting under CFSP really uh, have uh, much um, impact or success? It remains extremely tricky, just because um, the idea of consensus or unanimity is just part of the foundational ideas of the intergovernmental nature of CFSP. It needs to be owned by all the member states in principle. And I know a lot of diplomats who continue to tell me that, uh, you know, QMV would actually not be efficient and would rather be harmful in the area of CFSP because it would risk to alienate a number of member states and in that sense not really contribute to the unity of action and of the voice of the European Union uh, in the world. So that is a very brief speculation about the future. I think we will be with CFSP and with its main features for a very, very long time. I'm still waiting for the incredible uh, revolutionary momentum that would come in case of, an, of a severe external shock, which would uh, finally convince the European Council to turn the European Union in a, in a real collective defense union. It's foreseen in the treaties since Maastricht, and it hasn't happened, not even when Russia annexated uh, Crimea, which in my view would have been a quite unique momentum to do that kind of things. And the European Council has not really properly followed up. So I'm really wondering uh, what magnitude of a severe systemic shock do we need before the Union will indeed uh, make additional steps in the direction of a stronger 
CFSP and CSDP. I wouldn't know it. I think that with the recent decision of the Trump administration to remove part of the troops uh, from Germany, it may indeed um, make Europeans think louder and uh, more uh, urgently about the need to reinforce our own operational uh, autonomy. And as you know, I mean, we cannot really discuss the geopolitics of the current uh, setting in which the EU is uh, uh, currently operating, but we know indeed the Commission is now taking geopolitics much more seriously. We see it also uh, very interestingly in a number of recent initiatives of the Commission with regard even to trade policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and so on, but we also see it more and more popping up in um, the, the actions and the initiatives of the European external action service. So, I mean, something is changing there with regard to geopolitics. And I think in that sense, we have the benefit of living in interesting times. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wouters, for your uh, very, very detailed overview of the uh, questions posed by the common foreign and security policy of the European Union. Also for recalling us that in a way, uh, is the external security matters are also the, the history of the European Union in a way, because you started back from the 1950s until nowadays. I, will, I don't want to steal time from the next speakers, so we will go back to your presentation at the discussion time, if we have uh, uh, the, the time indeed. Uh, the, our next speaker is Professor Pavel Sturma, who is, first of all, I would like to mention that Professor Pavel Sturma is, uh, uh, is a, a long-standing partner of the University of Siena. Professor Sturma is Professor of International Law at the Faculty of Law of Charles University in Prague. And we have uh, um, a, an important exchange agreement with Prague and Professor Sturma has always been a very faithful partner and uh, reliable colleague when it comes to the, to the implementation of that agreement. So it's a pleasure to have Professor Sturman with us today. Um, he's also, I would like just to mention among his many affiliations, that he is presently a member of the International Law Commission. He's also been the chair of the latest session of the International Law Commission, and is also currently special rapporteur of the ILC on, the, on succession of states in matters of state responsibility. Uh, the topic uh, we selected for, for, for Professor Sturma is, uh, is, uh, uh, revolves around the issue of fundamental rights in the European Union. Uh, he will speak about the security aspects of the uh, EU fundamental rights charter. So, Professor Sturma, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President, dear Ricardo. It's my pleasure uh, to be with you, at least uh, online. Actually, I wanted very much to come back uh, to Siena, the place I like very much. It is also a very uh, long and good cooperation between our universities. And by the way, uh, it was uh, the King of Bohemia and the Roman Emperor Charles the First who established not only the University of Prague, Studium Generale, but also re-established and uh, granted the statute uh, to Università degli Studi di Siena. So uh, I hope that uh, it will be possible to uh, come to your university at another occasion and today uh, to share just a few uh, comments on the topic uh, you have already uh, indicated. I will try uh, to be brief and to focus on uh, uh, only some uh, aspects of the very complex uh, uh, topic, uh, security aspect of the EU Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights. Uh, in my uh, first part, I will provide a very, very brief presentation on the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Then in the second part, after uh, I will uh, focus uh, on the uh, Charter and it uh, will bring me to some uh, short um, conclusions. 
So first, uh, now uh, the first aspect, uh, I would start from saying that uh, indeed the most recent catalog of human rights uh, arises from the member states of the European Union and the EU institutions from the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. This document uh, adopted first in the form of a non-binding political declaration in uh, 2000 has evolved into the legally binding text uh, by reference in Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Treaty on the European Union as amended uh, by the Lisbon Treaty. Once the Lisbon Treaty of uh, 2007 entered into force on 1st December 2009, the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, thus became a part of the primary law of the European Union. It is quite well known document. The Charter is a complex document that uh, includes the longest uh, of uh, civil, political, economic, social and other rights, freedoms and uh, principles. They are organized in six parts called titles. The first, uh, dignity, concerning some of the most fundamental uh, human rights related to the right to life, the prohibition of torture, etc. Then, uh, second title, uh, freedoms, that uh, include the traditional civil and political rights. Uh, title three, on equality, which is actually the extension of uh, um, non-discrimination uh, provision. And uh, title uh, four, uh, sometimes uh, causing some troubles, at least for uh, some um, EU member states, uh, called solidarity, that includes economic and social rights. Then, uh, innovative, unusual in human rights documents is the title uh, five on citizens' rights, meaning here the rights of the EU citizens. So nothing to do with the traditional uh, civil and political rights. It is something in addition arising from uh, the concept of uh, the EU citizenship. And uh, last but not least, uh, Title VI on justice that uh, includes uh, the right to fair trial and some procedural rights. Well, uh, the Charter itself uh, also addresses the question of the scope of its uh, application, as well as the relationship of fundamental rights um, and uh, freedoms uh, to the rights uh, enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, the last title of the Charter, number seven, thus uh, contains some general provisions relating uh, to the whole Charter, in particular uh, its uh, field of application, the scope of guaranteed rights, the level of their protection, and the prohibition of abuse of rights, namely in Articles uh, 51 to uh, 54. I will not go through all uh, these provisions, uh, just uh, let me uh, recall uh, the solution contained in Article 51, uh, which is uh, essential from the point of view of the field of application of uh, that uh, charter. I quote, the provisions of this charter are addressed to the institutions, bodies, offices and agencies of the Union with due regard uh, for the principle of subsidiarity and to the member states only when they are implementing Union law. They shall therefore respect uh, the rights, observe the principles and promote the application thereof in accordance with their respective powers and respecting the limits of uh, the powers of the Union as uh, conferred on it uh, in the treaties. The end of quotation. So it uh, shows the specific uh, position of uh, this catalog of fundamental rights and freedoms in the broader uh, context of the constitutional and international uh, protection of uh, human rights. Nevertheless, uh, this is a uh, quite important uh, uh, document, uh, not only because it includes the longest catalogue of uh, um, human rights and freedoms in comparison with uh, other uh, international instruments, 
but also and in particular because this charter is uh, addressed not only or primarily uh, to states but uh, to the institutions of the European Union. Anyway, now uh, I will uh, go uh, to the core of my intervention and uh, this is about something uh, which is related to the very topic of this conference and uh, what is, at least in my view, actually missing or not uh, entirely uh, covered by uh, the existing text of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. It is namely uh, the lack of uh, security exception uh, clause or uh, clauses. From the perspective of the subject of the conference, one of the main shortcomings of the Charter is that it does not include any uh, derogation clause. I have in mind uh, such a clause that appears in major human rights treaties and allows uh, reacting to emergency situations. The present conference uh, will address according to uh, the program several kinds of threats to security and emergencies such as war, civil disturbances, natural disasters, mass influx of refugees or migrants, cybercrime or mm, now it's uh, uh, quite topical uh, the epidemic situations like uh, the COVID uh, which is also the reason why we are discussing now online and uh, uh, not in the premises of the University of Siena. Well now from uh, the perspective of um, uh, the European Union Charter the only relevant provision is Article 52, Paragraph 1 of the Charter that provides any limitation on the exercise of the rights and freedoms recognized by this Charter must be provided for by law and respect the essence of those rights and freedoms. Subject to the principle of proportionality, limitations may be made only if they are necessary and generally meet objectives of general interest recognized by the Union or the need to protect the rights and freedoms of others. The end of quotation. However, this provision is uh, very short and does not distinguish between two different cases of provisions that uh, in international law uh, enable to limit uh, uh, human rights and freedoms, namely uh, limitation clauses on the one hand and derogation clauses on the other hand. There are significant differences between them in terms of human rights interventions and the material and procedural conditions for the implementation. Let's start from limitations. They are directly provided for in human rights treaties for certain human rights such as uh, freedom of expression or association. These provisions uh, allow states to restrict uh, the exercise of human rights in order to protect the particular general interest, uh, such as uh, public security, public health, or the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Such limitations uh, must uh, have a legal basis pursue a legitimate aim and be necessary in a democratic society. Such provisions are well known, they are uh, contained uh, namely in uh, paragraphs 2 of articles 8 to 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights or in articles 11, 18, 19, uh, 21 and 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, in the case of uh, Article 18, it is not the second, but uh, the third uh, paragraph of that uh, article. By contrast, derogation refers to the temporary suspension of the application of certain provisions of the International Human Rights Treaty, which states uh, uh, resort to in order to cope more easily with a particular emergency. It could be a war or other serious threat to the life of the nation. 
derogations uh, uh, are, of course, uh, subject uh, to a series of uh, precise conditions. These conditions uh, are governed, uh, for example, by Article uh, 15 of the European Convention on Human Rights or Article 4 of the International Covenant. These are the following uh, conditions to sum up. Uh, it must be an exceptional situation, then it is the condition of necessity and proportionality. Uh, another uh, condition uh, refers uh, to the compliance with other international obligations in the field of human rights and uh, freedoms. And uh, then it is also the exclusion of certain so-called absolute uh, rights uh, that are not subject to any derogation, such as uh, the right to life, the prohibition of torture or inhuman treatment, or the prohibition of slavery, and the principle nullum crimen sine lege, at least uh, those uh, in some um, other treaties than the European Convention, the list of such uh, non-derogable uh, rights is a little bit uh, longer. And finally, uh, the procedural condition, which is the notification of such uh, measures uh, to uh, the depository of uh, uh, the Human Rights Treaty in question. So, uh, it is clear that uh, in the international law of human rights, uh, we have two uh, different uh, kinds of provisions that uh, enable states to deal with uh, security threats and emergency uh, situations. However, uh, Article uh, 52, Paragraph 1 of the uh, European Union uh, Charter does not look like a derogation clause. It rather uh, resembles limitation clauses which allow a restriction on the exercise of certain rights and freedoms in a normal uh, peacetime situations. It is not clear, uh, therefore, if and under what uh, conditions the Charter makes it possible uh, to derogate temporarily uh, certain rights and uh, freedoms in times of emergency. I think that uh, uh, this is uh, maybe one of the uh, specific uh, uh, problems in comparison with many other problems and shortcomings in the existing uh, European law when it comes to the problems of security. But I think that uh, because of uh, uh, the topic uh, I had to address uh, today, it uh, should be uh, uh, mention. Uh, I would say even uh, that uh, Euro European Union law, and in particular uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, seems to be a kind of law adapted to sunny days, but not to emergency situations. And I think that uh, in general, the European Union is not, uh, uh, as a matter of law and policy, very well adapted uh, to crisis and emergency situations. So I think that uh, if uh, this conference uh, mm, deals with the topic boosting European security law, I think that also it means uh, to adapt that law to that uh, reality of the today uh, world, which is uh, definitely not easy and uh, includes many uh, various uh, uh, threats and uh, uh, situations of emergency. So I think uh, then member states and the European Union institutions should be able in uh, such uh, extraordinary or emergency situations uh, to adopt uh, measures in the European Union law uh, that are allowed already uh, to states as a matter of international law when it comes uh, to the above mentioned uh, derogation clauses in uh, uh, the major human rights treaties. I think that it is, uh, of course, uh, not uh, maybe the main uh, issue, the main problem that uh, should be addressed, but uh, uh, because of uh, the importance of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, also because of uh, uh, the case law on the Court of Justice of the European Union.
I think that uh, um, needed to uh, be mentioned and I'm uh, glad that uh, I had the opportunity uh, to contribute uh, with this uh, intervention uh, for your um, uh, conference and I wish you the success for uh, this important conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Sturma, for your uh, very you know, effective and also short presentation, uh, because this uh, uh, allows us to save some time for the discussion time later on. Um, um, it's now our time to have a break. So I'm, I'm asking confirmation from uh, the organizers, from Professor Ventura and the other organizers, whether we should stop right now for, let's say, 20 minutes or half an hour. Yeah, we, we're uh, perfectly on schedule, so I would suggest that we take the 30 minutes uh, as foreseen and we'll reconvene at uh, quarter two, quarter to five. Okay, fantastic. Uh, after the break, the first speaker will be Professor Pardolesi.